All right, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 18. Exodus 18, Exodus is the second book of the whole Bible, and this morning is the fourth sermon in our five-part series in Exodus entitled, The Provisions of God. As God has now set the Hebrew people free from slavery in Egypt and saved them fully and finally from that Pharaoh who was trying to get them back by parting those waters of the Red Sea so that God's people could pass on through while those Egyptians were defeated in the sea. What we have come to see clearly in this current series is that God does not simply save his people and then exit the scene, leaving them and us alone to figure out life on our own. No, God saves his people to be with his people, to dwell in our midst as our God, because God's intention for us, once he has saved us, once we have been justified by faith in him and in his work of salvation, is to transform our lives more and more day by day so that we look and live ever more like Jesus Christ. And I want to continue to put that before us as a church, that being a Christian does not mean we simply get this ticket to heaven that secures us an eternity of bliss, but then for the rest of our days on this earth, we just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we will die. That type of thinking leads to disjointed living, whereby we try to present ourselves as one thing on Sunday mornings when we're at church around Christian people, but for the rest of our week, Monday through Saturday, we hardly think about God. The gospel doesn't inform or shape our lives in any way. The gathering of God's people on Sunday mornings for corporate worship takes a back seat to a myriad of other things, and by the time we get to our 70s and our 80s, we look the same as we did spiritually in our 20s and in our 30s. Friends, that is not the Christian life. As we have seen in Romans 8, 29, for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Is that happening in your life? in order that he, that is Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. God's purpose for those whom he has called to be his people is that throughout our lives, through the situations that we experience and go through, that our hearts, our faith, our character, our desires would be more in line with the one who experienced perfect intimacy and relationship with God the Father, namely Jesus the Christ. And so God does not save his people and then exit the scene. But just like he did with Israel, after he saved them through the Red Sea, he began to lead their life literally every step along the way through a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And over and over again, God was teaching them of their need to trust in his provisions for their life so that they would continually come to him as they found themselves in need, recognizing all that they had came from the hand of their Lord and that everything they needed could be found in him as well. God had miraculously provided that bread from heaven, manna that appeared on the ground six days of the week. He miraculously provided water that came forth from that rock when it was struck with the staff of God. Last week, we saw God provide victory in battle as his people lifted up holy hands in prayer so that just as God promised to do in Exodus 14, 14, the Lord had fought for them. Today, we're going to see another provision by our gracious God, namely the godly counsel and godly support that we need from the people of God. And so now, as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God for what scripture says, God says, wherever you're at this morning, if you're able, I want to invite you to rise with me. As we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word, Exodus 18, we'll read verses 1 through 27 this morning. Now Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One son was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have become an alien in a foreign land, and the other was named Eliezer. For he said, my father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. 
Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' son and wife, came to him in the desert where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of the Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods for he did this to those who treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and laws and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people. Officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and he returned to his own country. And this is God's holy and authoritative word for us today. Let's pray together. Father, your word is truth, and you sanctify us. You change our lives by your truth. So use your word to change our hearts this day. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. And together we say, amen. Please be seated. We live in an instant gratification society. We don't like to wait for anything. One of the biggest complaints I now hear in my home is how slow our internet is, which, to be fair, has not been great since we switched to WoW over a year ago. But when that buffering circle shows up on the screen, man, does the blood pressure begin to rise. There seems to be hardly anyone anymore that works for the same company for over 30 years, as we now need to rise as fast as we can, as high as we can, and loyalty on both sides is completely non-existent, and instant gratification rules the day, both for the corporation and the employees. Kids and adults now switch their allegiances to their sports teams based on who they think is going to win that year rather than sticking with the team from your hometown city through good times and bad. But this short-sighted view and approach to life stands in great contrast to the long, developing plan of God throughout history, and especially here in the life of Moses. 
Remember that Moses spent the first 40 years of his life living in the luxuries of the Egyptian palace, having been found as a baby in that basket in the Nile River by Pharaoh's daughter and then adopted into her home. But at the age of 40, Moses could no longer handle the suffering of his people, so he intentionally left the palace to identify with them. But as he carried out his righteous desire in an unrighteous way by killing that Egyptian taskmaster, Moses was then forced to flee from Egypt and go and live in Midian, where he met a man named Jethro, the priest of Midian, who welcomed Moses into his home and offered him a job as a shepherd over his flocks of sheep. Moses eventually married Jethro's daughter-in-law, her daughter Zipporah, and they had two sons, Gershom and Eliezer. And it was here in Midian that Moses then spent the next 40 years of his life until at the age of 80, God called Moses to go back to Egypt and to demand that Pharaoh let God's people go. Now, besides Jesus, you could easily make the case that Moses is the second most important and influential person in the Bible. And yet it took 80 years of preparation for Moses to receive God's call upon his life. But as his story develops over a long period of time, it gave Moses the the ability to have a long-term perspective on life, to let go of that immediate gratification pressure. For when that can be our perspective, we can make the right decision, do the right thing, do that which we know and believe God has called us to do, even if it means there may not be any immediate results that come forth from it. For when immediate results are demanded, we may compromise. We may try to manipulate others to get what we want now. But when we can live with the perspective that God is sovereign and in control of all things, that his purpose for our world and our lives are good, and that he is transforming our hearts through all the situations that come into our life. Well, then our approach to life can be completely different, and we won't view 40 years as a shepherd in Midian as a waste of time, but as part of God's good plan for how he was going to bring about a great salvation, even in the life of the very unsuspecting priest of another religion. In many ways, chapter 18 of Exodus is about Moses' father-in-law, Jethro with the first half of the chapter showing us his salvation and the second half, the godly advice that he then gives to his son-in-law, Moses. For 40 years, Jethro would not accept the faith of Moses, but as Moses continued to do the right thing over a long period of time, now we see new life come forth in the heart of this man, this priest of Midian who then provides God's servant Moses with the godly counsel and support that he stood in need of. And so what we want to see in our text this morning is that as God's people, we should have a long view perspective on life while seeking out and humbly accepting the godly counsel and support of others. And we'll develop that this morning by seeing first the hope of our testimony. Second, Jethro's godly advice. And then third, Moses' humble heart. And so first, let's see the hope of our testimony. Not only the words that we speak, but also the way that we carry ourselves with others and especially with unbelievers. Our passage today begins with Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, receiving word from a long ways away that God had actually saved the Hebrew people out of Egypt. And the first half of chapter 18 tells us of this great salvation, this great conversion of Jethro. And yet before we look at that, it's important for us to recognize at least why in part Jethro's heart was in a good place to receive that news of the saving power of God to deliver Moses and Israel. Remember back to chapter four, when after God met with Moses on Mount Sinai in that burning bush, and he called Moses to go back to Pharaoh and demand that Pharaoh let God's people go, what did we see Moses immediately do? It was pretty minor, We didn't draw a lot of attention to it when it happened. You would probably read this verse and not even give it a second thought. 
But here is what Exodus 4.18 says Moses did. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Moses had just received a direct call from God himself. Moses could have gotten up and immediately left, taking his family with him by the authority of God's word, God's call. And yet Moses honors his father-in-law. He seeks his blessing. He seeks his permission to go. Jethro wasn't even a part of God's people at this point. And yet Moses' approach to Jethro is honor and respect. For he knew that his leaving would come at a cost to Jethro because Moses couldn't take his wife and his two sons all the way into Egypt. And so they would need to remain under Jethro's care. But by handling things with honor and respect, Jethro then sends Moses out on his mission in peace, even if Jethro didn't fully understand it. And so now as word starts to travel back to Midian, that Moses has come out of Egypt alive, that he's brought the Hebrew nation of people with him and that they are encamped in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, Jethro, with great excitement and anticipation, rises and takes Zipporah and Moses' two sons. They rush into the wilderness to try to find Moses and see if that news was true. And we read that Moses rose and met them along their way. He continues to show Jethro that same honor and respect, bowing down and kissing him. If I hadn't seen my wife for 18 months, my father-in-law is not the first person I'm kissing. No offense, Bob. But this is what Moses does. And then they go into the tent, and verse 8 tells us, Then Moses told his father-in-law, all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and how the Lord had delivered them. Moses sits with this man, who if Moses is 80 years old, Jethro's got to be at least 100, who had lived most of his life as a priest of a false religion. And he testifies with his words of all that God had done to save him and the Hebrew people. But again, our testimony is not only the words that come out from our mouth, but also the way that we carry ourselves with others and especially with unbelievers that earns us the right to be heard. Do you show the same honor and respect to those who do not yet know Jesus Christ as Moses showed to this priest of Midian over 40 long years. Is the testimony of your life preparing the way for the testimony of your words to fall upon fertile soil that has been cultivated over a long period of time? I know for some of you, your heart's greatest desire is that your children your spouse, your parents would come to know and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. This passage is of great encouragement for us. That over the long haul, as we honor others with the testimony of our life, God, by his grace, can create a way for the testimony of our words to eventually prove effective in causing that heart change we so deeply desire to see. For as Moses testifies to the work that God did in Egypt, we now hear the newfound faith of this public figure and religious leader in verse 11. Jethro says, now I know that the Lord, Yahweh, is greater than all gods. Those who were eyewitnesses to the miraculous power of God to save them, they grumbled and complained all the way from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. But this man, who didn't even get to witness the miraculous saving acts of God, but only the effects of that salvation, he now responds with great faith in Yahweh the Lord and God of Israel. Because seeing is not always believing, right? But the hope of our testimony, both in the way that we carry ourselves and in the words that we speak, 
is that those who do not yet know the saving power of Jesus Christ would see him clearly, would see the effects of, our, of his salvation in our own lives and how it is changing us, and then they would respond with that same faith in the one true God. That is the hope of our testimony. And God, by his grace, just like he did for Jethro, can do in the hearts and lives of those that we love and desire to know the salvation of Jesus. Second this morning, let's see Jethro's godly advice. After their family reunion the night before, Jethro wakes up the next day to observe what a normal day in this Israelite community looked like. And what he observed was not good. This is what was happening in verse 13. Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. As a wise sage of at least 100 years, Jethro then begins to ask questions. He inquires of Moses to find out if what he is witnessing is the normal routine for this Israelite community. He asks in verse 14, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? Now, there's an important lesson here for us if we will learn it. That in our interactions with others, we ought to be slow to rush to judgment and instead ask questions. Inquire, allow them to speak and tell you what they are doing and why they are doing it. At times, the Christian world is known for that which we are against. And to some extent in our culture, that is unavoidable. But how much more effective would we be if we actually sought to engage with others to truly know them, to understand the why that drives the decisions that they make in their life? Wouldn't we then be more effective in helping them to see the solution to their heart's greatest desires, namely Jesus Christ, which we know is the only one who truly satisfies the desire of every human heart? And so Jethro asks Moses why. And Moses says in verse 15, because the people come to me to inquire of God, when they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another. And I make them know the statutes of God and his law. Jethro observed, then Jethro inquired, and now Jethro evaluates by saying in verse 17, what you are doing is not good. And the reason wasn't because Moses was doing the wrong thing. No, Moses was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. He was interceding before God on behalf of his people, praying for them. He was teaching them God's laws, God's statutes, so that as a redeemed people, they knew how to live. That was good. That was right. But what wasn't good was that Moses was trying to do that work all on his own for two million plus people. And this is why Jethro says in verse 18, you will certainly wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Don't change what you're doing, change how you are doing what you are doing. And so after Jethro evaluates, finally he advises. Because while Moses was doing the right thing as their spiritual leader, teaching them God's word, praying with and for them, he could only reasonably do that effectively for a few hundred people. And that task needed to be scaled up for a two million person nation. And so Moses' wise father-in-law instructed to him to look for men who were competent, who feared God, who were trustworthy, and who hated dishonest gain to be set over smaller groups of people, essentially providing structure for the spiritual care and leading of God's people, as there would now be those in, put in charge of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. That's a lot of direct reports. Now, there is a ton that could be said about this godly counsel provided to the prophet of God by his newly converted father-in-law, but let me just make two related points about it this morning. 
First, no leader can be effective on their own. No leader can be effective on their own. Sometimes our pride makes us think we can do everything, we should do everything, but in humility, we need to recognize, yes, God has gifted us with certain things, but not everything. And so we need others who have the giftings that we lack. This is especially true in the church and why many churches set up their leadership structure according to this passage and many others. This is why at DCF, we have many shepherding elders so that all of the members of the church have someone directly over their spiritual care. No one person could do all of that work. No church should ever be built around a single individual unless that individual is Jesus Christ. But while churches are always tempted to build everything they do around a single person, a charismatic leader and preacher in which we put all of our hopes for success, as Jethro said to Moses, if that's what you are doing, then what you are doing is not good. 1 Corinthians 12 shows us that a healthy church is like a body that has many parts that are of all equal value and worth. Yes, there are different parts. There is distinction in roles. The hand does not do the same thing as the foot. The eye doesn't do the same thing as the ear. But no part can say to another part, I don't need you. You are of no value here. If we as a church are going to be effective in accomplishing our mission of making and maturing disciples of Jesus Christ for the glory of God now and into the future, we must be in every member ministry where all hands are on deck and involved in making new disciples of Jesus and maturing as disciples of Jesus. On that day, as Moses set leaders into place, 262,000 leaders were chosen and unleashed for ministry. No leader, not even Moses, will be effective on their own. And the church needs each person to use the gifts that God has uniquely gifted you with so that we together can accomplish the work that God has called us to. A second and related takeaway from Jethro's advice is that spiritual communities, churches, we need a plurality in our leadership. We do not operate as a CEO, pastor-led church. Sometimes people make suggestions to me as if that's the case, and my response is always, you know I don't make those decisions unilaterally, right? Right? Last week, we saw the installation and ordination of elders and deacons. And throughout the scriptures, with Jesus calling 12 apostles and the seven deacons being established in Acts 6, and the apostle Paul appointing elders, plural, at every church that he plants, we see the need for God-ordained leaders in the church. Elders and deacons who come alongside of the pastors to provide a plurality in its leadership. Because when we understand the fallen and broken and sinful condition of every human heart, even the pastors and the leaders, we see the wisdom of God in setting up checks and balances and accountability in providing plurality of leaders for those entrusted with the care of shepherding God's people. Moses, as the spiritual leader, Just like pastors in the church must never neglect the call to preach and teach the word of God, to pray with and for the people, and to ensure that happens. Jethro provided the godly counsel for Moses and us to see the need of having a plurality of leaders involved in the work of ministry. Finally and briefly this morning, let's notice Moses' humble heart. The older I get, the more I find myself attracted to humility. And I find myself loathing the arrogance and the cockiness of human beings that, yes, at times is even found in myself. And so as I read verse 24, so Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. I found myself utterly impressed that Moses listened. 
and he heeded the wisdom that was being offered to him. How would you respond if someone came up to you and said, what you are doing is not good? In your parenting, in your job, in your ministry at church, I think for me, I'd probably get defensive, maybe even respond back, who do you think you are? And so I'm blown away that Moses' words were not. You know, God called me and not you to do this work. I just led two million people out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. God has given me tremendous responsibility. They need me. Don't tell me that what I am doing is not good. That's what I would have expected to read. But in great humility, Moses heeds the wisdom that's being offered to him. And he does everything that Jethro told him to do. Great leaders, and to some extent, we are all leaders. Even if you don't have a job title that says you are. In your homes, in your workplaces, in your marriages, at church. Great leaders are humble They're teachable. They look for the nuggets of truth, even in the criticism that comes our way, so that we can always get better and become more like Christ. And so we ought to seek out and humbly accept the godly counsel that comes from others, especially from our brothers and sisters in Christ, who know us, who are living on mission with us who can challenge us to grow and see blind spots in our lives. We should certainly seek out that godly counsel, but we should also seek out godly support as we develop intentional relationships with those inside of our church family. People who can encourage us as we walk through some of the most difficult trials we will experience in our life, who can pray for us as we experience highs and lows, who can spur us on towards greater love for Christ and living in accordance with God's design. For as it was true for Moses, so it is true for us. You cannot do it on your own. And so let me encourage you this morning to intentionally develop relationships with other people in this place for the sake of your growing in love for Christ and living for him. Become part of a small group if you are not yet so that six to 10 people in this place know you, grow in their knowledge of you, can challenge you and encourage you and whose gifts can complement you as you live on mission together. Talk with Pastor Mike at the Connection Center after the service about what it looks like to get involved in a small group or about ministry opportunities that you can be serving in here. The vision for ministry that God lays out for us in Exodus 18 is one where every member is both doing ministry and receiving ministry. And as God's people who desire to become more like Jesus, We should always be humbly seeking out and accepting the godly counsel and support of one another. That is the model for how Christ will build his church. Let's pray together. Father, in your wisdom and goodness, you designed us to be in relationship. Since you, the one whose image we are made in, exists in relationship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May we seek that out. May we be vulnerable with one another so that we can receive the counsel and the support that we need. Jesus, we thank you for sending your Holy Spirit into our lives so that we know our relationship with you is always secure. Help us to trust in that always. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand as we respond?